Yes. <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, hey. Oh, hey, everyone. Are we here? Have we started this thing? Is this thing on? Yes. I'm going to go actually check my own. There it is. I see that we're on. Yes. So with my hoarse voice from whatever cold I got this week, we will start the show in three, two, this is twists this week in science episode number 730 recorded on wednesday july 17th 2019 what is a constant hey everyone i'm dr kiki and tonight on the show we will fill your heads with brain implants zombie ant fungus and variable constants but first disclaimer 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 children Small statured humans, young in age and high in energy. They like sugar, playing with things, being curious about everything, and they have visions of the future. Sometimes these visions are very different than the futures they actually encounter upon growing up. The world, it seems, only needs so many cowboy princess astro pirates. What the world does need, of course, is scientists, and lots of them. Science is a field for the curious. Science is all about playing with things, and science runs on visions of the future like a hopped-up seven-year-old with a fistful of pixie sticks. If there's one thing you can inspire the next generation with that they can relate to the most, it is science. Because at its core, it is a childlike curiosity, an active imagination, and above all else, a drive to prove that those who came before didn't really know everything after all. And nowhere is that more apparent than This Week in Science. Coming up next. Oh. <laughs> I've got the kind of mind I can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know what's happening. What's happening. Science. What's happening? What's happening? What's happening this week in science? Good yeah. science to you, Kiki and Blair. And a good science to you too, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We're back again to talk about science. Ha! Who knew? Who knew that's what we'd be doing this week? And this week, what did I bring? I brought stories about constants, uh, brain implants, and we have an interview with Dr. Lukas Pasteka about measuring constant variability in just a few moments. What do you have for us, Justin? Uh, what do I have? I've got two million year old mother's milk, <laughs> secret life of <laughs> zombies, and radioactive islands don't don't keep those islands that would be something you should just give away to the ocean forever wow. <laughs> yeah what Bla yeah. blair what's in the animal corner Bla blair i have <laughs> uh edible insects insects in pain and to coin a phrase elbow dynamics Mm, that's a elbow dynamics. It's an awkward parade wave. Yeah, yes. It's actually <laughs> the story's not that far off from that. As we jump into the show, I would love to remind everyone out there that if you are not yet subscribed to This Week in Science Online, you can find us on YouTube where you can click that little notification bell to be notified when new episodes are live or published. You can also find us all places that podcasts are found, radio.com, Pandora, Stitcher, Spreaker, Spotify, TuneIn, Google, iTunes, or just visit twist.org. All right, but now it is time for the show. So without further ado, I'd love to intro introduce our guest, Dr. Lucas Pasteka. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Physical and Theoretical Chemistry at Comenius University in Bratislava, Slovenia. Welcome to the show. 
Slovakia, but Slovakia. yeah, well. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's it's all right. It's all right. So Good science to everyone. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. So Dr. Pasteka has had to get up very early in the morning, thanks to the time difference here. Um, and so he, he's been having to deal with this wonderful constant time, the speed of light. How, that's right, that's right. How, how fast the sun goes down and the, the night goes by when you know you have to wake up early in the morning. We and, all know and on top of it, all this darn plate tectonics making everything so far away. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's right. And part distance and measurement is going to be a large part of our conversation for today. But I, to get started, um, Lukash, I'd love to know, how do we define a fundamental constant? What makes it fundamental and what makes it a constant? So it's basically something that cannot be, uh, can only be measured, cannot be derived from any underlying theory. So that, that would be something that is fundamental that we hit a limit of of what we know of, of what we can derive from so that would be there's 20 something of these fundamental constants altogether which are basically just numbers or parameters in how our physics are set up how did you get interested in studying these constants i mean something's constant it's the it's the end of our ability to 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 minimize or break it down any further. Isn't that kind of dull? Does it get boring? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it always interesting to, to, to try to figure out what's beyond the end? It's basically what people always did for, for a very long time. And physics has done this for, for uh, even centuries now, right? And uh, currently, physics is trying to come up with a new uh, revolution, so to speak. So people are looking, or physicists are looking for so-called new physics, and this would be part of the new physics. So the old physics works too well for too long, and they are trying to poke holes in the theories and find places where it breaks down. And this would be one of the places. So when you say old physics, is, I mean, is that the standard model? What is old? What is old physics versus new physics? Okay, maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe that sounds sounds too too much, uh, too too strong of a statement. Uh, <laughs> by old physics, I even meant uh, quantum mechanics and okay. relativity, oh, wow. which by today's standards is considered old because it's hundred years old and it's been tested for a while. It works really, really well, but it doesn't work for everything. So. Yeah, the standard model would be the the old physics and uh, something which is beyond the standard model would be the new physics that we are looking for. So there's there's something interesting in a constant that has always fascinated me, uh, which is if you went back way back past the last hundred years, way, way back to when people were assigning gods to be in control of things. Uh, one thing that there was never a god for was gravity. Uh, yeah, that's right. There was a north wind god, south wind god, the god that looked over sheep and comfortable footwear. It was a god for everything, <laughs> but gravity was such a constant. And I think the reason was because it didn't change. Uh, up was up, down was down. The winds changed, things, bad things happened to sheep or shoes got out, whatever the, right? Um, things had changed, which were then associated with something that could cause a change. But because gravity was such a constant down here on earth, it was never uh, 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 sort of delved into or thought of as something. Uh, yeah, that's anything. right, that's right. It, it was actually not even obvious that this is a force. It took one very smart man and one apple to figure that out. Yeah. <laughs> right. so, th so then when, when, you're, when you're sort of saying like there's all these constants that are just there and they're in place, then I, I immediately thought to like, yeah, well, th this was a constant, gravity was a constant, and so we stopped looking further because that's just it. That's the answer. Up is up, down is down. Constant, look no further for- uh, Yeah, done to... deal. Yeah, yeah. exactly, yes. exactly. So you're saying now there's a push to delve deeper into these constants and see mechanism or, or, or figure out how else they, that they may be in play. Yes, part, part of why people are looking for this is uh, sort of philosophical or it comes from the fine tuning. So it's very hard to explain why everything, all of the constants are tuned for us to be here, 
they are mm -hmm. precisely tuned. So if you change a few of them, a few of the constants by a couple of percent, they, uh, life could not exist. So if you change, I don't know, the alpha constant, the electromagnetic force by a few percent, uh, then the atoms would not form or stars would not form. There would be no life. And apparently there is life and, and there's way too many constants, way too precisely tuned to figure out why is this one of the answers could be that they actually change in time or in space and that we are located at that time and space when it's actually good for life to to emerge so yeah so what you're what we're getting at is the direction of your research which is looking into the idea of variability in constants not just that hey there could be parallel universes in which these constants are different and in some of them there's no life and some of some of them um you know it's bubble universes or you know things things formed very differently um but rather during the evolution of our own universe these constants change that they're that they're variable yes yeah exactly that's the motivation yeah is there also the the possibility that there could be heterogeneity within the universe itself? That the constants are different in different places. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So there there is some astronomical evidence even for this. Hmm. So people have been looking for for these uh, these changes. Uh, and a couple of years ago, an Australian Australian team found uh, uh, astronomical evidence from quasar spectroscopy that uh, the constant alpha, the strength of the electromagnetic force, is uh, changing across the universe. So there's a dipole wow. or a gradient across the visible universe, which is not very large, but there is something. It's, it's a bit inconclusive because uh, astronomical observations with this kind of precision, they have all sorts of problems with systematic errors and stuff. But there's definitely something that pushes people to look for these things but we want to do it more precisely which would mean set up lab measurements on earth which would right. be better can you talk yeah. about, about i've got uh for people who are watching right now i've got an infographic up from that australian team uh referring to how they did their measurement looking at these quasars and they looked at the the light the electromagnetic light spectra from the quasars but they did three different measurements and can you talk about kind of their methodology there and how yeah, what you sure. are doing would be different so so basically quasars are these really really bright light bulbs that we get for free all around the universe and they they shine light uh to our to earth and when that light passes through some galaxy or a gas cloud uh you get spectra out of it so you, you can measure spectra of, of uh, hydrogen or helium gas or many other elements from very distant places in the universe and compare these spectra to the spectra measured on Earth. And then if you notice the, the black lines there, those are the lines, the absorption lines that we're looking for. And if these lines are slightly shifted uh, with respect to the spectra that we know from, from here, from Earth, then that's, that can be an indication of, of a shift in the fundamental constant. And uh, these three measurements that are on the picture, it just uh, that's just three different telescopes that are around the globe. So the Australian team, they, they merged all the data from all the available telescopes and all the available quasar spectra. And from that, they derived the, the gradient across the universe. Yeah, what's so what I find really interesting about your idea and this you uh, you've got a paper that's recently out, um, which is what what I uh, you, you came to me with and said, I've got this paper and let's talk about it. Um, that is not looking at stuff from distant galaxies, but is like you said, here on Earth. And so how do we measure and how do we start measuring things that are around us here and what it, what is the idea that you proposed and tested and kind of did this proof of concept for so the uh, the people who do the astronomical measurements they have the advantage that they have very very large scales at hand but the control of the precision is very low so we wanted to reverse this 
and we wanted to have a very well controlled experiments done here on earth uh, but the problem there is that you need a really really high precision because the changes within our lifetime or within uh our, within the time that the earth moves moves across the the background of the universe or the background in, in the gradient of, of some of these uh, changes of, of fundamental constants is very small. So the, the changes in the constants are fractionally somewhere on the 17th digit. So it's mm -hmm. really, really far, far down there. So like uh, 10, 10 to the minus 17. 10 to the minus 17 per, per year, yeah. roughly. Per so, year, so that's okay. Per year, yeah, yeah. So, so you would measure for a year and maybe you would see a shift in, a di on, in on the 17th digit. So that's currently where we're at. Uh, the Most of the measurements that were done so far were done by spectroscopy and they hit this limit of 10 to the minus 17, roughly and they cannot really push it any further. So we tried to come up with an alternative path to, to measure these things. And uh, we were thinking, so what is the most precise device on, her, on Earth? And that would be the gravitational wave interferometers or basically any laser interferometers. Those, those are the most precise mm -hmm. uh, instruments that we have at hand and we had to come up how these could be applied for to the measurements of, of the fundamental constants so the laser interferometer yeah thank you for the infographic uh it's basically just one laser beam is split into two perpendicular ones they reflect of the mirrors and recombine again and if the the length of these perpendicular arms are slightly slightly different then uh, the, the interference pattern changes and, and the signal changes. So these can actually detect uh, changes uh, at the level of 10 to the minus 20 or 22 even, which is incredibly precise. And that's why we're all, they were also able to measure the gravitational waves. And since these interferometers are all about changing lengths or measuring lengths, we were trying to uh, figure out how length of or size of material depends on the fundamental constants and that's what we what we calculated in in our paper for different materials used in interferometry uh, how they change with the constant alpha which is the strength of electromagnetic force or so-called fine structure constant and how it changes with mu which is the proton to electron mass ratio and uh, so we didn't actually measure it, we are theorists, but uh, from what we see, it would be possible to push the detection limits a couple of orders of magnitude further than it was possible up to now. So let's work through this kind of uh, with a thought experiment. This could be fun for a theorist, right? Um, if you were uh, looking, say, at a material, an element like gold or uh, the, the carbon in a in diamonds what would your experiment like what what you're suggesting mean for looking at one of these one of these materials well there are a couple of different options here so if you want to build an interferometer uh it could be a, a cavity interferometer where you would have a crystal cavity of a solid block of material whether it's diamond would be probably a bit too expensive but maybe we'll, silly. no no we'll just go get it from you know the crown jewels the tower of london <laughs> sure you know, get some nice Why ones we'll good tomorrow. yeah but <laughs> sapphire sapphire is also used which is also a bit expensive but less yeah. so and and so so we uh, we calculated how these materials change so there will be one option to have a block of crystal and have the laser light pass through the crystal or then it could be a vacuum type of interferometer which was basically uh, similar to the ones that measure the gravitational waves which are uh, the LIGO and Virgo so you would have a tube made out of solid material which is uh, empty has vacuum in it and, and the laser light only passes through the vacuum but the change of the uh, the 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 size of the tube itself would change as well so th therefore it could be detected and then there's also uh mass resonance uh, uh 
detectors for gravitational waves, which are usually large cylinders or large spheres of solid material. And uh, then uh, you measure the resonance in, in, the, in, in, in the size of this material. And how would, uh, based on your your calculations, how would the a change, a variance in the electromagnetic force, this alpha, how would that have potentially affect a material versus the change in the mu? Are they the same? Are they different? Would you be looking for different uh, different results? They are. They are quite different. They uh, for. For alpha, usually the heavier materials are better. So it's a relativistic effect. And, and as we know, relativistic effects usually go hand in hand with heavy elements or super heavy elements, even if, if that's possible to get. So, so the heavier, heavier elements are better for alpha and the lighter elements are better for mu. And so the, the reason uh, is uh, mu comes from vibrational effects and alpha is from the relativistic effects. But both are influencing the electronic structure of the, the material, so how the electron glue holds all these atoms together. And if you change the, the physics of, of the glue, then you change the spacings between the, the atoms, and that's that translates into the length. So in the end, you're you're looking for an actual change in the crystalline structure, like if you're looking at a crystal or... Yes, exactly. Yes. Wow. Could you actually uh, borrow LIGO to do this? <laughs> yeah, we have to talk to them. Yeah, we have to talk to them, definitely. Yeah, it would be great. Uh, maybe we don't even have to borrow anything uh, to... Or, or ask them to rerun any experiments for us. Maybe it has been already measured. Yeah. We just yes, we just have to look at the data and look for different types of signals than uh, are the signatures for the gravitational wave uh, mergers of star of of uh, neutron stars and black holes. It's, it's probably right there uh, in some uh, some some noise trimming uh, mm -hmm. protocol data the, the software that they put the data through. <laughs> exactly exactly that, that's the that's the problem yeah yeah but that, if we get our hands yet. on the data it could could help us yeah oh that's interesting so in reading about your work uh, there's this interesting it's not just the kind of like okay how big is an atom um how does how does the variance or variability of this affect the size of a chunk of diamond over the course of a year. You know, it's not just that. It actually has potential to tell us about the distribution of dark matter. And can you I'm trying to wrap my head around that. So can you help a little bit? How how does how does what you're looking at in terms of molecules and atoms start to scale up to the level of our universe? Yeah. So so with dark matter, uh, this is also connected to the fundamental constants because with some theories that go beyond the standard model <clears throat> and some theories of dark matter like axion theories they predict that uh, the there is a little bit of an interaction with dark matter between dark matter and and the, the rest of the, the universe and and this interaction could actually produce locally changes in the the fundamental constants and since the dark matter is not distributed equally everywhere, we know it's everywhere, but uh, it's not smoothly distributed. And there's some uh, bigger structure in the universe. And uh, if, if we are flying or if our, our solar system is flying through a lump of dark matter, then temporarily uh, values of some constants could change and then go back. For example, so if we would look for blips in, in in these measurements, for example, from LIGO, this could be explained by by the dark matter. So this could be one option, uh, and again, a new way how to detect dark matter. That to me is just uh, it's it's such a fast it, it, it's mind blowing and a, a fascinating new idea, um, you know that and also as you're saying we could already have this data because LIGO is already working, but they're just not looking for that specifically. Yes, yeah, exactly. They are looking for a very specific kind of signal. And we would be looking either for oscillations, periodic oscillations, which would signify the interaction with the dark matter field, 
or very, very slow drifts, which would be the cosmological evolution of the fundamental constants, as, as we uh, talked about before, or those uh, temporary blips, which would all, be... All things that would register as, as noise. Yeah, from exactly. Exactly. You know, the, yeah. Which is, exactly. I love that. So, so the, the raw data uh, is revealing, that could be revealing secrets of the universe that we had uh, <laughs> not theorized or not uh, yeah. dared to ask before. We could have already collected this information. And they were like, yeah. oh, that was the train going through the tunnel up top. But uh, no, actually, it was some, some dark matter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But oh, since yeah. we have a couple of these interferometers around the globe, if these events are synchronized in all of them, then we can actually say okay, this is mm -hmm. significant. This is not just a blip in the data of unknown origin. This could be... Mm -hmm. This could be explained by by our theory, and and then even oh. because we have three of them, we can even deduce the direction from where it came. So, so that's kind of fascinating. Then it would take like just basically an algorithm to look for uh, over over these different instruments to look for a time signature pattern over that raw data, to yeah. regardless of what it is, uh, it's seeming to seemingly. Uh, happening in a regional span of ah there's the thing what's the reasonable span of time that <laughs> these things should be occurring should they be occurring instantly in all these locations or is it like uh is it not in, no 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 not instantly not instantly yeah. it's it's basically similar to to gravitational waves because we are passing through no it's actually slower because we would be passing through some thirty thousand kilometers per per second uh, per per hour uh, across across the universe, I am not sure. I don't remember the speed, the exact speed of of our galaxy. But so, so this be... is, I mean, this is also a fascinating thing. Like this is also. Oh, I've always talked about the problem of time travel. But we're on a planet that's spinning, you know, a thousand miles an hour around its axis, and then the planet's going around the sun. At, I can't remember what it is, thirty four thousand miles an hour, something crazy. Uh, it's more than that. It's much more than that. But then the, yeah, it's the really universe, fast. the universe itself. Now, our solar system is spinning within the, the exactly. solar, uh, within know, the, the galaxy, within and the, the galaxy, galaxy moves. and then the galaxy is moving. Everything so if you went moving. back, this is what else is the problem with time travel. Time travel, by the way, has been invented dozens of times. Every time somebody does, they do it from a stationary time traveling device and find themselves <laughs> instantly transported to the cold of space because their garage was nowhere near their garage even 24 hours ago. It was so exactly. far away. They can maybe they actually they might be outside of the solar system, if not the galaxy at that point. Yeah, that, that's right. That's right. But we have we have an idea though of how we might be passing through a zone of different constants of physics. Yeah, because because we know how fast we travel compared to the cosmological background or the the cosmic microwave background. So that's our reference, okay. and that's where we assume the dark matter structures would be static so so okay wait a second that's because that brings up the interesting thing then there's a constant position for the variable constants that they inhabit within space if we right, can because move here we do know looking at the at the universe uh we've got an idea of this clumpiness of the of, of space and where dark matter is clumped up based on our our how we've been looking at the distribution of mass yes the, these these the pictures that you're showing those are those come from simulations because we cannot see dark matter right but but we we know from about these structures from astronomical observations of lensing and micro lensing and uh, the, the bullet cluster is very famous for this. Mm -hmm. So 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 we would know that there is some structure to dark matter. We know roughly what the density of the dark matter is all around us. It's it's around us. It's all around uh, or or through the Earth, uh, but the density is very low locally. But uh, in some places it's it's higher. In some places it's lower. And we could be able to detect these these changes. So just just to give you an idea. The, if you collect all the dark matter within the, the the sphere that our Earth creates, it would be roughly a few hundred grams, like like a kitten or something. Aww. A kitten, Aww. dark matter kitten. Earth has a kitten of dark matter. Yeah. <laughs> That's 
<laughs> so uh, what I'm interested in is this idea of this, I guess, the clumpiness and the possible variability from place to place. It's going to be a very slight variation, as you've said. Would it be enough of a variation to actually make a difference in the structure of anything that we know to be if we were to move through it no in, in our everyday life nothing would really change yeah. so so that's why also we why we haven't noticed anything un, until now but we have to really really try and look for this very uh, precisely and very dedicated uh, scopes so so unfortunately uh, this is not entirely obvious that this, these changes are in place, but there might be, and we hope they are, and it would be great to, to see them and to confirm our theories. But for, for the everyday life, nothing would really, really change. In terms of the evolution over the whole time scale of the universe, we've talked with other physicists about the beginning of the universe and we've talked with physicists about the end of the universe and many how every, possible ends and yeah. all yeah how things <laughs> may have begun and how they may end um you know thinking about if there is a change if these uh if these constants are evolving like uh you know the dark energy pushing things apart or dark matter clumping if it's if there is the variation over time Will that affect the different possible endings? outcomes? Yeah, yeah, it it could actually, but it very much depends on on how much the constants could could vary. Mm -hmm. So if if we see uh, the original idea actually comes from from uh, from, from this, uh, it comes from Dirac and his large number hypothesis, where he hypothesized that um, since the, the ratio of the gravitational to electromagnetic force is a very, very large number. And uh, also the age of the universe uh, expressed in, in these kind of constants is a similarly large number. Num number. Uh, how about maybe this is actually uh, one comes from the other, that they are proportional to one another. And, and, and the strength of, of the constants was equal at the beginning of the universe. And then slowly over time, it diverged so that the gravita gravity is so much weaker than the electromagnetic force. And that was the original idea why where people started looking into the variation of fundamental constants. But this, is, this idea is a bit shaky, but at least it started the field. It did start it, yes. Um, from from your own perspective and what you're looking at, um, how how do you? I mean, you hope that something is variable. You hope definitely, that, yeah, yeah, of course, of yeah. course. Otherwise, I wouldn't be working in the field. Yeah, <laughs> you're not just doing it to confirm the constancy. You're hoping. Um, what I like in in the ideas of new physics and these alternative uh, hypotheses to. Uh, say the standard model. Um, are there any that that pique your interest the most? Mm. It's it's hard to say. There's way too many currently, but these kind of experiments are actually useful for uh, deciding which of the theories uh, can be valid or which are not, uh, because they have different predictions and even for the variation of fundamental constants. And by by doing these measurements or pushing the the detection limits further, we can decide that some of these theories should be thrown out and some some are uh, we should focus on only on some of them so so maybe we'll we'll see the the idea of supersymmetry is a nice theory but uh, so far nothing has been really confirmed so, uh, string theory again similar uh, seems beautiful but uh, no no direct predictions that have been confirmed either we'll see how it goes for what you're doing, obviously, it's computational and theoretical, and there's the development of things like laser interferometry that have a, that would allow experiment experimentation to actually take place. Um, do you see or can you imagine any technologies that would maybe take it 
the next step further? Like, is there a particular development that you're just kind of waiting for <laughs> to happen? Mm, <laughs> not, not that I know of. Not that I, it would be a yeah. nice surprise if there was a suddenly something more and more precise. But uh, so far, our focus was on the laser interferometry because they are so well developed. Much, much more than than anything else that we know that could be useful for these measurements. So, but it's not only the LIGO and Virgo and these huge interferometers, but even the smaller tabletop lab sized ones are are still very useful for these experiments. So that we can actually try and convince some experimentalist group uh, to to do a dedicated experiment and and to to measure for a year or two something like this just in a lab not not on LIGO this would be the laboratory with the locked door that nobody yeah. goes into <laughs> <laughs> this is one of those experiments that would have to be set up and you just go okay nobody unless you're checking and not touching anything yeah, just collect data and that's <laughs> it <laughs> it's it and I, I i really i i love the idea that this you know the technology is already there very often in theoretical physics, there's not an immediate possible experiment. It's like, hey, we, we thought of these things and you can do them when you figure out how to make it work. Yeah. But <laughs> if you're we actually... can test it, we might find out. <laughs> yeah, but you're actually saying you can test this. Yes, test yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. That's where we are trying to convince people to actually take the idea to the real world, not just on the paper. And finally, all the, the time spans of these experiments are usually measured in the lifetimes of PhD students, which is a unit that is very <laughs> often used in physics. Oh, no. Does it have its own <laughs> standard notation? No, no, no. Unfortunately, <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen PhD that, but it sh half -life. should be introduced. Yeah, yeah there's, that should be. You're right, Blair, the PhD half-life. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> what, what I'm wondering is, the, this whole time is just really bothering me. This this basic sentence of the variability of constants, just the language side of it is really bothering me. It's so oxymoronic. So if you find out that there is this variability in our fundamental constants, what are we going to call them after that? Fundamental parameter, maybe. <laughs> I like yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that how how neat if it at some point can go to the end actually figure that out my yeah. son asked me the other day he said what what do what do electrons break down into how do electrons how long do electrons live and i had to go look look it up and apparently it's longer than the universe will be <sighs> around electrons suppose they, they have a half-life that is basically as long as the universe has been around so far yeah. no one ever <laughs> saw any of them break nobody and you don't expect them to no would would something i mean if you know mu has variability or um you know would it affect this calculation of our idea of how long an electron lasts mm, not not how long it lasts but mm. uh, maybe what changes is like the effective mass of an electron so, so that that would be uh, that would be one thing that that changes, but the lifetime should should stay the same. It's still the same particle, but it would behave slightly differently, because all these changes are very very small, very slight. Yeah, I do I I do appreciate knowing that should these constants be variable, nothing will really change. <laughs> yes, yeah. For us, everything stays the same. That's that's very good. It's Ooh, is comforting, <laughs> isn't it? No doomsday. Yeah. No, I do appreciate that. Um, I, if, but, as uh, we get, uh, oh, go ahead. Real quick, uh, but does that have any implications for the the universe beyond uh, where matter is currently inhabiting post Big Bang? Does it have implications for a beyond the sphere of our uh, known or theorized or observable or universe observable here. and yeah is there is it does it mean that we're encroaching uh, the territory that we're taking up now with our yeah. with our universe uh was there a different physics there previously that we've aff affected or pushed aside or incorporated in some strange way well, yeah we think so we think so but uh, if if the the cosmological evolution is in fact in place then then yes e even as we speak it's still varying very very slightly and and the further we 
further down the timeline we go and further down the space line we go as well. So as, as we move through space, it, it should change a little bit. So, so, so it, it's a so little beyond, bit an answer of what was here before. Uh, I cannot really answer answer that. Uh, that that's very hard. Uh, before Big Bang, you mean? Or yeah, I mean it, it has implications <laughs> in uh, if there are these varying constants that have evolved and changed over time since the formation of our universe. It gives some insight <clears throat> if you can find these things. It gives some insight to what was there before. Yeah, exactly. The yeah, yeah. Yeah, some of wow. the theories of, of what we know and and how the the uh, the universe evolved would change if if we can really confirm that there is an evolution, then we would have to change also how maybe even how all the universe is by a little bit. I guess the, these these expectations would change as well. So there would be all sorts of uh, consequences if yeah. we really incorporate it into the theory. Discoveries have consequences. Yeah, yeah, yeah they <laughs> usually do. <laughs> what is your next step? What are you working on next or now? Mm, I'm, I'm still working also on the variation of fundamental constants field. So we're trying to look for the ideal material for, for these kind of measurements. Mm -hmm. But then I also have many other projects unrelated to the variation of fundamental constants. Like I, I'm also working on, on uh, super heavy elements, which are the elements at the very end of the periodic table. Yeah. So recently, some of them were given new names, right? And uh, so I'm trying to also look at the properties of these newly discovered elements and how they should behave chemically, physically, and because it's unknown from the experiment so far, they they've seen a couple of atoms, and right. they are you talking? So you're are you talking about like one nineteen and one yeah, exactly. yeah. one the things that are really heavy and they yeah. only last for this blip in time, and so yes. you have like yeah. no time to look at them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So that that's why uh, te theory comes in handy because on on the computer it it works out fine nothing breaks down and you can actually model these materials or chemicals with the super heavy elements like copernicium uh, yeah, relatively easily and you can predict their properties and then mm -hmm. maybe you can suggest ways how these can be confirmed on the on those very very short time scales that are available for for the experiments those are the shortest experiments in the history of science. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they are pretty short. Yeah, milliseconds often. Yeah, but years, maybe years to set up and milliseconds to run. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. But uh, people are still convinced that there might be the so-called island of stability in the per periodic table. Mm -hmm. So if they are able to prepare these super heavies uh, with the uh, bigger number of neutrons the the nuclei could be stable or at least more stable and uh, they, they can survive for definitely more than a second and even minutes or hours or days or which would some, be more uh, more chemical like or maybe yeah. somehow uh forming them and creating a molecule at the same time that could help stabilize them. exactly yeah that's that's one of the things that we are also looking at yes I would love to see that in a science museum someday. Oh, Can yeah, you lift the, heavy, the super heavy metal? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, you can't. No. Yeah. What would you like people to take home with you? Um, um, oh, not with you, with them. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, question, words. Would, would you like people to take you home with them? <laughs> no, that's not no. <sighs> People take the kittens home, okay? What, yeah, what, exactly. Take home the dark, dark matter, matter kittens. kittens. You That's will right. regret taking home the dark matter kittens. <laughs> you will regret it. It's really cute, but it's going to devour the souls of everyone. No, that's not. That's a different kitten. No, <laughs> yeah. They're just dark matter kittens. There's a lot of variability there. And the, never mind. Anyhow, what would you like for people to take home with them about the work with, that you do and, um, and, and why you do it? Um, yeah, because... Physics should not be uh, sad and boring and stable, and we should evolve like we do in every other field. So that's that's what why we are looking at these things. And the take-home message is that not everything you deem constant 
is necessarily really constant. So, yeah, I, I think it is it is good to keep that in mind. Philosophy. Things change. Yeah, <laughs> that's a philosophy there, not just physics. That's <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> How physics can be applied to your everyday life, everyone. There we go. <laughs> Dr. Fishteka, thank you so much for joining us. Is there thank you for um, having me? You're welcome. Is there a website or any other social media or anything that uh, that? Um, besides can... the ResearchGate website that I have my uh, my site on, I, I don't I don't have any other social media that I would advertise. But yeah, ResearchGate. But you can you can see my papers, and right. that, that's it. <laughs> Wonderful. We will put links to those on our website. All right. Thanks yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Have yeah. a great night. It's a wonderful talking with you. Absolutely. Have a wonderful day. <laughs> See you. Bye. Everyone, I hope you enjoyed that interview as much as I did, learning a lot about the variability, but possibly in the constants, the things that we think are constant. How fun with Dr. Lukas Pesteka from Slovakia. And now it is time for us to take a break. We're going to take a break. This is This Week in Science. We have more science. And guess what? I have a story about the Hubble constant coming up. <gasps> Apropos. Apropos. Do you think I themed that? Perhaps. Perhaps, yes. We'll be back in just a few moments. Stay tuned for more This Week in Science. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of This Week in Science. I hope that you are enjoying the show. If you are enjoying the show, sign up for our newsletter. That's right. If you head to twist.org, there's a pop-up window that unless you have your pop-ups blocked, will pop up and you'll be able to sign up for our newsletter. We have a newsletter that we are sending out once a month now and to talk about things that are in addition to the show. We hope that you will try it out. If you don't get the pop-up window, you can send me an email at kirsten at thisweekinscience.com and I will, sign, I will put you on our list. Also, if you love our show, please do support us. We have wonderful ways that you can support us. One way is through merchandise. That's right. We have a Zazzle store over at twist.org. Our Zazzle store is full of lots of twist goodies. We've got bags and t-shirts and pillows and polo shirts, phone covers, tote bags, so many wonderful things. And they all support This Week in Science. That's right. A portion of those purchases goes to support our show. So if you want to wear your twist flair, head over there. Like, did you hear me rhyme? I can rhyme. I can rhyme sometimes. Back at twist.org, we also have a couple of other ways where you can support us, not necessarily in the consumption manner, but in the spirit of giving. You can click on the yellow donate button to use our use PayPal to donate one time or in a recurring fashion, however it's up to you, but that is the PayPal way to donate. If you would like to try joining our Patreon community, you click on that Patreon link in the top of the bar at twist.org. It'll take you to Patreon where you can click on the red Become a Patron button and choose your level of support. Everyone $10 and over will be thanked by name at the end of the show. If you donate at the $25 a month level. We now have a new twist t-shirt. It's our wonderful twist design on a uh, canvas t-shirt. So it's a thinner, stretchy t-shirt that's kind of nice in navy blue with the orange logo on front. Uh, $25 a month and more will get you a t-shirt. I just got them in and I'm mailing them out soon. So get yourself a t-shirt or just 
be thanked on the air if you want. But you're charged only once per month. And also, if you can, tell people about Twists. Twist.org, you can click on the orange subscribe button, which you can immediately click on YouTube, iTunes, or Google Play to take you to one of those big three to subscribe in the manner of your choosing on a device of your choosing so you never miss an episode of This Week in Science. If you are subscribing on YouTube, be sure to click that notifications bell if you want to be notified of our new episodes. We really do appreciate your support and couldn't do it without you. Thank you. The libraries that chose the way to go New conclusion The methods of hypothesis and patience are the only things I need Put on a pair of goggles and go looking for the things I couldn't see The answers lie somewhere within this scattered plot top and the scatter plot of science is back with this week in science. Yeah, scatter plot. It's time now for this week in what has science done for me lately? lately. Ooh, getting better all the time. <laughs> oh, <laughs> harmonies, yeah. so good. May Harmon Archer wrote and said, what did science do for me? I didn't die or go blind or have my bones twisted or become sterile from polio, measles, mumps, rubella, whooping cough, or influenza today. Yay. Yeah, that's a good good. Second. It was very good. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Indeed. Thank you, science, for keeping us healthy keeping us protected from diseases that we once died from or yeah. were yeah they were kind of a big deal once upon a time yeah they kind uh, of what, disease yeah. For sure. yeah yeah disease yeah those in particular polio measles, back in mom. those days back when we had diseases yeah. rebellion bah. whooping cough influenza yeah. bah, we're working on the influenza for sure okay you want to tell us what science has done for you lately you need to send me what science has done for you. You have to tell me because I'm not a mind reader. You, listening right now, send me a note. That's right. You can leave a message on our Facebook page. Just go to This Week in Science on Facebook. Leave me a message or send me an email. That's a great way to do it. Kirsten, K-I-R-S-T-E-N at thisweekinscience.com. We keep filling this segment of the show with your little letters. I love doing it constantly because I have a story about a constant right now. Uh, is, it, is it a variable constant? Well, yeah, that's kind of the story. What? Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Thanks for spoiling this story, Blair. Well, we didn't even have to have a little interview. It turns story. out constants are variable. Done. Turns End of story. Out Blair is a spoiler. <laughs> spoiler alert. Oh, I should have said that first. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I blew it too. It's after. Okay. All right. All right. So <laughs> we have spoken before about this controversy related to a constant called the Hubble constant, mm -hmm. right? One of one of my least favorite, by the way, just going on record. I've always been proven wrong, but I'm, I'm going on record again. Insane. A long time ago, almost 100 years ago, Edwin Hubble, he's an astronomer, discovered that the universe had been expanding since the Big Bang. We didn't know this all the time. He discovered it, right? He was looking at supernovae and he was like, there's something going on here. And there's an expansion that's happening. Mm -hmm. And how fast it's moving, how fast that expansion is taking place is called the Hubble constant. Exactly what the value of that constant is, we don't really know. We've been like, oh, fudge factor. Okay. And so researchers now, part, have used part of a the couple reason, of though. different... 
Yeah, but but I'm just going to say a couple of uh, we've we have tried to nail down this value, and this is where the controversy comes in. Researchers have been trying to do a couple of different methods. First is looking at the cosmic microwave background radiation and how it has changed over time as a measure of the growth of the universe. And it has given us one value. And the other has been looking at, uh, at Cepheids, these pulsars, and their brightness and their uh, or their luminosity and the time between the pulses can be used to measure how far away they are from our own planet so that you can go, oh, that's a big star that's far away versus a small star that's close to us when they both look the same. These pulsars and their luminosity and other things, these can be used to actually give a value of distance. And they've been used to determine another value for this constant of change, of growth of our universe. It's different. So we have two different methods. And so these Carnegie researchers were like, okay, we're going to do another method. Method where This method is going to break the tie, right? It's going to give us the data that's either the big one or the small one. And it's yeah. going to agree with one of those. Mm -hmm. yep. Nope. <laughs> and we now have a third value that's just about smack dab in the middle between the other two. So that makes it correct. Doesn't that kind of <laughs> right. idea, I mean, it's sort of like the steer for the middle lane. The, uh, yeah. uh, it's, 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 uh, oh, some baseball player I was hearing about. They, they woke him up in the 13th inning. He was completely hung over. He went up to bat. He hits a home run. They, uh, bat, he goes back and his teammates go, how did you do it? They're like, I aimed for the ball in the middle. <laughs> there you go. Cause that's the right one. It's always the right answer. So yeah, I, I, mean, this, I take this the three bears. It's yeah, just, just right. right. Just right. Yeah. I take issue with this whole situation, and I can't actually explain why, except <laughs> that <laughs> when you drop like a a a handful of marbles on the ground, I understand there's friction, and we don't know, we don't think that there's this friction at the outer limits of our universe. But do we really know, right? But when you do that, you have these marbles. So first of all, they slow down as they expand out. They lose this kinetic energy. But mm. there's also variability between them based on how heavy they are and what part of the ground they're moving across and all this kind of stuff. There's all sorts of variables all over our universe based on... Um, celestial bodies relationship to each other potential dark matter all this other stuff that why would it be constant so you don't think that the universe is potentially radiating out in a perfect ball of energy no <laughs> i don't so, it's like a messy spill yes it's like a spill exactly yeah. like at least one of the measurements this is this is a uh i would okay i mean i'm not going to quote the website here but it's uh, apparently, uh, means that any distance in the universe stretches by 0.007% every million years. So part of, part of when we're talking about this, this massive expansion, it looks really big over large time and space scales, mm -hmm. but it's really so it's, it's tiny in like near regionally kind of locally things. If, if. The distance between where you are and the corner store changed by 0.007% every million years. It's going to take the same amount of time over your entire lifetime to walk there and back. You won't notice it. Right. And but this is where dark matter and dark energy come in, right? Because you've got dark energy that's fueling that expansion, putting pushing things that are distant further apart. Dark matter is maintaining the clumpiness so that things that are kind of in the same area are kind of staying clumped together in the same area. But yeah, that expansion is happening and it may yet change. And so this is, I think, part of the debate of what's happening. Is it a constant? Hmm. Is And this and this harkens back to our earlier conversation uh, with Lukash uh, as to whether or not it's been a constant forever, no. right? <laughs> it would. 
And potentially based on the cosmic microwave background radiation, that giving us one value is because maybe that has changed over time. And maybe this other standard candle way has given us another. This third method now that they've used is um, they've used red giants, which are a type of star at the end of their life when they're using up uh, hydrogen. And in this process, or I'm sorry, not hydrogen, helium, other h h e helium it gets turned on and so their structure changes and when their structure changes based on this energy chemical energy shift it's recognized they can go oh that's a red giant that's what it is and so they can they've looked at all these red giants and kind of gone okay there this is the brightness the, pe the how the peak brightness of these things and so now they have a scale and they're able to hmm use these red giants as a third kind of standard candle yeah. of sorts. Um, but anyway, according to this expansion rate, it's 69.8, which is right in between the old ones. And nobody really knows why, except now there's a third number. And so the controversy continues. The Hubble constant, not yet a constant. <laughs> <laughs> No, they should they should call it the Hubble parameter. Yeah, Hubble I like parameter. that a lot. Mm -hmm. I'm into yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, speaking of other things that are changing very quickly, this week, uh, Elon Musk, he's come out to talk about uh, another of his many companies, not SpaceX, not Tesla, nothing to do with Powerwall batteries. Not oh, the boring no. company? Not the boring company. No, no, no. This one is Neuralink. Neuralink's been around for a little while, hasn't made many headlines, uh, except, you know, in the in the very geeky techie communities. Neuralink is a company that he founded to create something of a sci-fi concept. People have called it a neural lace in which we would have electrodes or a lace of electrodes implanted in our heads to allow us to communicate wirelessly with uh, computers, hmm. with prosthetic devices, and in Elon Musk's dreams, to become symbiotes with AI. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in, in recent years, he's come out saying, hey, everybody, we need to be pretty afraid of artificial intelligence. This stuff is going to yeah. beat us. We're going we're gonna to lose to the AIs. You know, he's been... Yeah. And then the Probably light went on not. and he went, and oh, <laughs> so I should be in control of that. Yeah, he says, if you can't <laughs> beat them, join them. And so his goal is to make us one with the artificial intelligence. Exactly. So I'd be all for it, would... except I know that there'd be pop up ads. <laughs> Most likely, and, that, yes. and that's the thing that I'm like, no, no. When I go, when, when I, I don't want pop up ads in my internal dialogue thinking. That's the one place that they're. Hopefully, you'd be able to turn them off. Yeah. But well, also turning off in general. Is what I really just said, you know, the, the implants, no thank you. A cunning hat that I could put on or take off, connect, disconnect, that could be interesting. Oh, but okay. even before we get Claire, to this point, you have some foil hats. Just the tinfoil hat. Before we even get to this point, there are many, many te technological hurdles that need to be overcome and addressed. And in this last week, Elon Musk gave a big presentation. There has been a paper published uh, related to Neuralink's most recent public advancements that they're making public. Uh, and he's also giving, I believe, another presentation again uh, today, actually. But what they have been doing is essentially taking the next big step forward in electrode technology. They have taken the number of electrodes and the size of the electrodes to another level. They are now, instead of using solid little wires, or you could even imagine them as tiny needles into your brain, which stick in your brain, and then your brain, you know, it's kind of moving around like jello. And if that electrode isn't moving, you're, you're, 
you can imagine the damage that could potentially be caused to the tissue and then the immune response that would reduce the effectiveness of those electrodes. So what they are using is a new material that they're developing and they call them threads. So they are a flexible material that would potentially flex with the movement of the brain. Additionally, they have developed a robot for injecting these electrodes into the brain. So it's a robotic, they are developing robotic surgery to transplant or implant these electrodes in because they have to have a very accurate way of getting tiny, these tiny, tiny thread-like wires into precise locations in the brain. They're looking at locations, say, in the motor cortex and the somatosensory cortex at this point in time. Uh, that would potentially have therapeutic uses, say for prostheses or or other things, um, brain computer interfaces that would help people move robotic arms, maybe. I don't know. Uh, but so they need to have a getting something. If you've ever tried to thread a needle and that little wobbly piece of thread, putting oh, it through so the annoying. hole in the needle, you know the how hard that part. is to do. Yeah. And it works really well when you get the thread nice and straight, right? So it's the same kind of thing going on in the brain. Injecting these thread-like electrodes in, you have to have a way of doing it that allows it to penetrate in a needle-like manner. So, And then they have to become flexible. And so they're developing this method. They're also increasing the number of electrodes, uh, whereas historically the maximum number of electrodes was like 128 Per electrode array. Now they are looking at increasing that number substantially up to something like 3,000. So you're so, going to drill 3,000 holes in somebody's head? Mm -hmm. No, no, no. One big one hole. hole. <laughs> oh, one big <laughs> hole. Okay. Uh, that better? Now, <laughs> but not, the, the, the only thing I'm going to take away from this conversation, honestly, is that even my brain isn't in a constant state. It's no, me. it's not in a constant state. And wow. here's another problem. Uh, talking with somebody on Twitter today, uh, Brian William Jones, who's also a neuroscientist, he brought up the, uh, the, the problem of gliosis. And we've talked on the show a lot about glia and how, they, how important they are for neural signaling, for the immune system uh, it, within the brain, the immune response in the brain, um, and also for picking up and sending local s signals. And one thing that we know happens with electrodes in the brain is gliosis, where they harden. There is a they they basically create an immune response that leads to a plaque or a scar tissue that forms around the electrode that reduces the effectiveness of that of that electrode. It can't pick up signals as well, and it can't send them as well either. So this study still still does not really address the that issue and with gliosis that progresses over time with all electrodes any implant in the brain to date and that even with this stuff they're looking at a human human implant uh, volunteers maybe within a year what? um yeah they're working on rats right now at Neuralink and they are hoping to go on to human trials within a year um but even with that there will be deterioration and we know that these devices need to be swapped out. So if you're looking for a permanent implant, you're going to go in having to know that you will be having brain surgery, not once during your life to have them implanted, but probably multiple times to have the old ones taken out and to have new ones taken in. We don't know what effect that will have on the brain. And so there, there is something there just technologically there are still many 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 hurdles N musk is great for the big vision stuff yeah. um, he's got an amazing team of people at Neuralink. maybe they and the other researchers around the world who are addressing this will address these issues but um yeah who knows maybe what, what someday it, what it sounds like is they need to construct uh a part of the brain. So this is a weird thing that I, I, Kiki, maybe this is a, a mythology. Maybe this is a real thing. Uh, there's a, a node, a little fold in Einstein's brain, which they say is something that you see replicated, uh, a, a plasticity, a formation that takes place in a certain area that is common amongst people who play violin. 
I don't know if you've ever, maybe you've not heard of this, uh, or maybe this is the thing. Like, it could also not be a thing. I'll uh, just uh, full disclosure. Um, but if there's, if, if there's an, oh, oh, go ahead. No, what I, all I was going to say is I don't know if it is this particular fold. I, I think that may be a myth when you say this one fold is only in people who play violin. I think that in itself is mythology, but okay. there is greater folding okay. in brains like Einstein's. So there's greater folding is, but there, but there, but I've heard that some element, uh, some this is okay, this is, uh, but uh, couldn't uh, a a structural change that takes place in the brain from having a lifetime of interacting with the violin, say, um, before implanting, uh, it may be that you would have to take advantage of something and repurpose it versus just implanting and do and do a thing. So it might be like, okay, you can get the brain implant, but you have to study violin for 20 years first because we need a change in this region that we can then co-op that won't cause scarring. That will be something peripheral uh, that we're going to co-opt its regular function to communicate with this device. I mean, it might, it might be a little bit more effortful than picking a brain region that we think is uh, not as useful or not as, uh, you know, or just uh, uh, picking brain regions where there's access currently that could have scarring, glial effect, uh, downstream effect, but creating a a structural change in the brain through something else, and then you lose. You're going to lose the ability to play the violin. Okay, at the end of this surgery, I know you mm -hmm. spent ten years developing it, but we're going to use that portion of the brain that that, that caused this extra node or fold. Uh, to do the interaction with this implant. It may be something a little bit down the line where we have to incorporate uh, an actual uh, adaptation of the brain itself to be able to uh, jump in. I think I, even I, beyond that, I wonder if at some point, if we do go into this extra stimulation, this extra communication with artificial intelligence, will that change the structure of our brains? Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think that's an even a, a, a more interesting, another interesting question. I have a oh. question that maybe I just am missing something here, but I just want a clarification here. We're talking a lot about the nuts and bolts of how to make this work and mm -hmm. that there could be human trials within a year. <sighs> Why would I as a human want to sign up for this trial? What is the real world benefit of being able to commune with AI? So uh, at, this point, at, this, <laughs> yeah. at this point in time, if they are doing those human trials, it's going to not be communing with AI. That is not what's going to be happening. It's going to be, oh, look, I'm sending a message on Twitter with my brain. Um, it oh, will, I think I think it, it will be, be, but, it, be it, the but what they're looking at, or, no, exactly. Uh, people who are trying. Yeah. Yes, that would be the what they are. Uh, first going for medical is medical therapeutic purposes. So it will be for people who have locked in syndrome where they can't communicate to be able to use a brain computer interface to be able to send messages and communicate with people about mm -hmm. their needs. Um, it would be paraplegics, people who can't move to be able to control devices in their environment or even, um, you know, extra limbs. Um, you know, so initially that's what it would be. It would not be, I am becoming one with an AI. That's right downstream. That's like his big right. vision yeah. thinking. So yeah. I guess, I, and I know we, we have more science to talk about, but I guess I'm not seeing a big difference between this and non-AI related studies that we've talked about on the show. Being able to control a robot arm with a, a neural link. Mm -hmm of a different kind or being able to generate speech even based on brain waves that we've talked about just recently. So mm -hmm. do you really need the AI to get this stuff done? I guess is my question. No. Um, and what I was trying, I mean, that's the kind of fun futuristic sci-fi yeah. spin on it. But like the real news of what they've done is they have uh, created this new electrode array 
that is flexible and um, has more wires, which means connection with more neurons, which means a better resolution, better, higher resolution signal. They've also created a new um, chip for interfacing between those electrodes and computers that apparently will connect via USB-C to so, devices. <laughs> yeah. So but the idea would be Blair, the idea would be that and it's the rob and and the surgical robot as well. So they've right. got yeah, but, a few things together but the, that are uh, but it I sounds see. like it sounds like the premise though uh that Blair would be that you don't have to uh remove the hat at the no. end of a session. Like no, the, right. the the idea is to create a a semi permanent interface that would be wearable for days and weeks and months and maybe years as opposed to getting hooked up for a session and then taking off the skull cap with the yeah, right. mm -hmm. and with uh with this i mean like as i mentioned the immune response in the brain we still don't know how long these electrodes will last and so i think that's going to be another big step is if these electrodes last longer in the brain than current electrodes that'll it'll be a it'll be a huge boon to this brain computer interface research in general it's it will it it, it will make things step forward a i bit, feel like is, this is going cool. to be more attractive to women uh in that in that uh men are going to freak out a little bit more about a device that's in your body that then has to be removed and replaced every once in a while and women will be like oh so it's like an iud I get it. <laughs> oh, same it's thing. normal. Yeah, yeah, I've done this. Yeah, okay. same thing. Yeah. yeah. For an anyway, object in there, go for it. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, Elon Musk and Neuralink's white paper is on the bio archive and available for anyone to read. So if you're interested, you can give it a look and give it a read. And that's it for me to start the show. Justin, I mean, not start the show. What? We're in the middle of the uh, show. Starting the second half of the show. That's this that's is fun. this week in science. Yeah, yeah. What do you have, Justin? So I have zombie ants. What? Yes, ants who, th uh, through no fault of their own, become host to invasive fungi mm -hmm. that seem to take over and control their minds and bodies, forcing them to bite and cling from high foliage. The reward they get, though, at the end of that is uh, the fungus pops out the back of their skull and mm -hmm. rains down spores on lower-dwelling ants, thus infecting them mm -hmm. as well. So... Uh, now, one element of the zombifying fungus, uh, mind-controlling bag of tricks, is being revealed thanks to Colleen Mangold from Pennsylvania State University, who says, The mandibular muscles of infected ants are extensively colonized by the fungus. It's uh, pretty exciting because it's the muscles of mandibles that are affected by this infection, not the nerve. They seem to be rather unaffected or infiltrated by the fungus. Uh, so this isn't so much mind control as it is apparently, according to this research, uh, directly specifically targeting muscle tissue uh, in the mandible that Gosh, causes the biting to take place. Now that's worse. You're 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 aware of what's going on, well, and you have to bite down on this thing, and you're like, I can't stop. So there's something that seems to be missing from this. Okay, so the uh, it's not the nervous system that's 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 driving the the lockjaw, but there is still the behavior where the ants go to a high structure before biting on. Uh, that's it, it. It gives an advantage because if it goes up high and the, the spores come out the back of the skull, they go down and can, can infect more ants than if they were on the ground and the spores just went to the dirt. So it doesn't explain that portion of it. Uh, what they found is that the muscle uh, was contracted so forcibly that the filaments of the muscle fibers themselves, which normally slide past each other when a muscle contracts, were damaged and swollen. So this was sort of causing the locked muscles. They also found uh, the fungus had broken the membrane covering muscle fibers leaving the fibers exposed. What's then possible is that the fungus is, okay, so they've got these little beads, these little structures, little vesicles that they discovered that they haven't determined exactly what they are yet in the muscles uh, tissue. They suspect that it could be the fungus, uh, little balls of toxins that then are having a release and causing the muscles to spasm and over contract. 
It could also be an immune system reaction from the ants trying to fight off the fungus. That's the next step. They need to go and take a look at what those little vesicles are and, and see if it's coming from the fungus or the host. Uh, but really interesting, uh, the mind-controlling zombie fungus that uh, attacks zombie ants uh, is not necessarily controlling the brain in at least this aspect. They still have to answer that other question, though, because there is something that's causing them to, to climb mm -hmm. to the high. Or, or they're just normally climbing up to a high point, and that's somehow triggering. And it triggers it, and then they get stuck. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, is it, uh, could it be <laughs> yeah. sunlight activated in some weird way? So, anyway, right. uh, there's, there's some interesting hmm. uh, stuff to suss out just how that's going on. In other news, Australopithecus africanus. Uh, their mother, the mothers of this two million ish plus year old human or hominoid, uh, breastfed their infants. It says here for 12 months after birth and continue to supplement their diets with breast milk during periods of food shortage. This is according to research published in Nature by a number of universities that were working together. Uh, that's actually, I guess, not too surprising considering. Yeah, that's what that, breasts are for. <laughs> yeah, that's. Well, I bet it's the long term, right? The year. That sounds like a long time compared to most animal species. Now, what's interesting is the animal species of current humans, it's, it can be a year. It can be much longer than a year. Yeah. Uh, if you look at our closest non-human relative, the chimpanzee, they can nurse for five years about no problem. That's kind of a normal chimpanzee thing. Uh what I find really interesting about this study, though, is that they discovered the breastfeeding from a tooth. They used mm. tooth chemistry analysis that enabled the scientists to see breastfeeding in a two million year old uh, set of teeth. They uh, so it says there in this in this uh, this paper it says extended parent uh, parental care is considered one of the hallmarks of human evolution. So I guess that's despite it also being a thing chimpanzees do, which seem content on staying chimps through a long period of evolution. But, but maybe five years of breastfeeding is a hallmark of chimp evolution as well. Uh, it's, one of those, it's one of those statements that I always, you have to dismiss uh, as soon as you read that something is a hallmark of evolution. It's yeah, well, I think it's slightly yeah. meaningless. I think it's very interesting, though, to look at the difference between, you know, we all we have are our primate relatives and ourselves at this point in time, right? We're able to go, okay, so chimpanzees do this, bonobos do this, and we do this. And then we've got all these other monkey species, orangutans, you know. Apes. A the apes. Right. We're able to compare and contrast just among what's living right now. And... Mm. It is interesting that chimpanzees will breastfeed for so long, up to five years, that five years is when they wean because humans, for the most part, do wean their young before that point. Usually if they, they can't, we can feed them much younger, but I think on average, it's maybe around two to three years around the world. Um, and then, you know, in, in the United States, of course, it's much earlier than that most of the time. Um, but how interesting to be able to take this you know, this this archaeological fossilized evidence from teeth and now be able to add a different picture to our our, our hominid ancestors and go, okay, this is norm like this was normal this long ago. This was normal among our ancestors, not just against these extant species. Yeah. And they can also do like so this is not a th I think I I think this has come up before and I always maybe just forget this. Uh so the way that teeth grow is uh, very similar to what you might uh, think of a tree ring. Uh, when trees have like rings, but we see the bands in a tree and they usually indicate seasons, like the wet season or like a, a yearly cycle between the bands. Uh, you can count back and you can see, oh, here's a thick band. That was a wet season. Here's a thin one. That was a dry season. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is sort of indicating to me that the, 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 the rings on a tooth are applied almost daily and so what it gives is an extremely high resolution picture of events occurring 
mm -hmm. during the early part of an individual's life in terms of nutrition, food intake. Um, there's, uh, I think they, they're looking at uh, high lithium, a mechanism mm -hmm. they're saying is, is, is used to reduce protein deficiency in infants. Uh, so you can see periods where they might have been a little hungrier. And, and uh, so they've also, there's been some other similar studies being applied to Neanderthals. This group is now going to work on, uh, on, on, on hominin species and go through teeth and look for these similar signals of early developmental layers and start to try to paint a picture of how infants were raised at different time periods throughout our evolutionary history, uh, which, can, which can tell you some things about parenting, perhaps, mm -hmm. and can tell us some things about uh, the climate or environment those hominins were, were dealing with at the time. But it's an, ins like, an insanely high resolution map uh, that, uh, that is, a is available. Uh, yeah. And how like interesting to know that these uh, Australopithecus, that they, um, even after kind of weaning, that in times of low food, they would go back to breastfeeding. Yeah. I will support my child that they had that they weren't like pushing their kids away. They still had that close bond and they were close parenting and taking care of their young. I think that's pretty consistent across mammals that they they do a kind of a half and half for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And that, that part of the reason for that is that they are carrying their very own grocery store with them. So they never have to worry about their baby going without, which yeah. I think is really I mean, evolutionarily, that's why that's why mammals were so successful is that they could travel and nourish at the exact same time. Yep. Yep. Didn't have to be static didn't have to be constant yeah but that's also why there are so many mammals that are altricial that are just little balls of fat that can't do anything yet, you know which yeah. is most is most apes most of them are like that at least at the start where they just all they can do is is hang out and wait to be taken care of there's not they're not very good at running around like a baby giraffe or a horse or anything like that um and so mother's milk is really important for that because they have a lot of development and growing to do outside of the womb. But, um, it also, yeah, means that mom has to carry their baby around and do everything for right. them, which means they can't also forage. All right. I'm going to go, I'm going to go, uh, I'll be, I'll miss, I'll miss the thread for a second. I'll be right back. Cause I'm going to bring a baby picture, uh, of me that basically illustrates your point. I am a ball of fat baby. There's <laughs> no, I'll be right back. All right. Because it is time now for that time of the show that we love to call Blair's Animal Corner with Blair. She loves our creatures, great and small. By pet, still a pet, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant patterns. What you got? Thank you. I can't start without that. Um, so... <laughs> I have a story about animals and specifically a story about humans eating animals and more specifically about animals that humans should eat. We know that eating animals in general can be a problem for land management, pollution, water use, and most importantly, our carbon footprint. There's a lot of contributions to climate change from raising meat, but there's a way to get the protein that you need while still getting uh, what is not so detrimental to the planet. And of what course, what are you getting at here? I what are you about bugs. Yeah. Oh. bugs. Bugs. Oh. Yes. Oh. So uh, at least 2 billion people on our planet, that's about a quarter of the world's population, regularly eat insects. Us here in the Western Hemisphere think it's real. You know, the Northwestern really think it's um, 
it's it's a little ucky, but uh, that's not the way in a lot of the world. But in the meantime, um, researchers wanted to look at exactly what nutrients there were to be gained by eating insects and other invertebrates. And in order to do that, they they were very scientific about it. This was the very first synthesis of antioxidants in insects as compared to other food items. So they tested a range of commercially available edible insects and invertebrates and some other food items using various measures of antioxidant activity. Inedible parts like wings and stingers were removed. Good, they don't taste very good. And then the insects were ground and two parts extracted for each species, the fat and whatever would dissolve in water. Mm, delicious bug fat. Each extract was then tested for antioxidant content and activity. Uh, use it, they used the exact same setup to also test fresh orange juice and olive oil, two foods that we know have antioxidant effects and are known as foods that are healthy for you. Everyone knows olive oil has really important things for your body in it. Um, so water-soluble extracts of grasshoppers, silkworms, crickets, they displayed the highest values of antioxidant capacity. It was five-fold higher than fresh orange juice. What? That being said, that comparison was for dry, fat-free insect dust. Mmm, delicious. <laughs> Tough to swallow. Uh, but if well, they used a similar dilution as to OJ, about 88% water, grasshoppers and silkworms would have about 75% the antioxidant activity of OJ. Also, uh, insect dust AKA cricket flour is a very common use in a lot of foods today. So uh, I know in my imperfect produce box, I can get chirp chips, which are cricket based tortilla chips <laughs> and they have high protein and it's using exactly that, this idea of the insect dust. We had, then, we had uh, cr the cricket flour uh, chocolate cookies. chip cookies yes. at the entomology, entomology conference. conference. Yes. Uh, yeah. And you can also get uh, mealworm flour as well, which is uh, a little bit more fatty. I think it's better for baked goods. But regardless, uh, then they looked at the fat that they were able to consolidate from these insects and other invertebrates. So giant cicadas and silkworms, the fat from those actually had twice the antioxidant activity of olive oil. So a couple of things happening here. One, just kind of quick disclaimer of there's a lot of question questions around antioxidants still. The science around exactly what it does for your body and how much you need and all this kind of stuff is still kind of squishy. But we know in general, the antioxidants are probably a good thing in your body. So um, they help with uh, ongoing oxidative stress. So that's an important thing for sure. Uh, so they want to maybe take this information to adapt dietary regimens of insects also because through this um, comparison of all these different invertebrates and what the antioxidant uh, content was in all of these, they were able to identify, for example, that vegetarian invertebrates had the highest antioxidants. So that means also that theoretically diet may have something to do with the nutrients they contain, which makes perfect sense. Grass-fed beef versus corn-fed beef have different nutrients, vitamins inside of them. So knowing that, they might be able to adapt dietary regimens in insects that are in micro uh, livestock so that they can actually uh, raise these animals on the best diet for the best protein for humans to augment their antioxidant content um, for human consumption. But ultimately, um, the other idea is that uh, if you can show more potential health benefits, perhaps humans uh, that are, are currently kind of averse to this might be able to see their way around uh, kind of adding this into their diet. So they're finding new ways to encourage insect consumption. And so uh, recognizing that they're a good source of antioxidant may help. It's good for you. Eat it just like your spinach <laughs> and your broccoli and exactly. all the other vegetables that you're and, not eating. And and don't <laughs> cheat. Don't get it powderized. Just go grab a bug and eat it. No, thanks. The, the legs some... will stick 
stuck in your throat. In some parts of the world, it is common. Charles Abroad in our chat room says, in Thailand here, can confirm there are insects for sale at the market. On the menu. Very so they, they, they also, you know, tested things like tarantulas and scorpions because people do eat them, but they were not as high in antioxidants. So really it was the vegetarians that were the... the What's what's really interesting on top of this, I hadn't seen this. So the antioxidants and the fat content, that's a new twist on this. Uh, previously, there had been a study comparing, I think, crickets and grasshoppers and mealworms, these uh, these insects to actual meat. And mm. it turns out that crickets and grasshoppers have a better nutritional profile in mm -hmm. terms of the nutrients that they contain. So vitamins and minerals that you want to get than meat. And yeah, they so also have looking, fiber, which meat doesn't it, really have. Yeah. So in terms of a good dietary choice, insects are it. And we just have cultural issues. If yep you know, we don't want to eat them, then that's what that is. Very soon it's going to be, well, I don't know, very soon, but someday you might find yourself where the insects are going to be the cheapest, best, healthiest option for your family at the grocery yeah. store. Forget, forget the roasted, the roasted hazelnuts or whatever. It's going to be your roasted crickets at Christmas time. Um, now that I've, I've convinced all of you to eat the insects, let's talk about how insects feel pain, shall we? Oh, um, come on. <laughs> so this is a study from University of Sydney, Charles Perkins Center, looking at compelling evidence that insects feel persistent pain after injury. So since about 2003, mm -hmm. scientists have known that insects experience something that we could say is analogous to pain. Um, so in this, in this case, it was looking at um, the idea that you can sense and avoid dangerous stimuli, stimuli that has hurt you before. In non-humans, we call this nociception, which is the sense that detects potentially harmful stimuli like heat, cold, physical injury, for simplicity, in insects, you could call this pain. The idea that it was a negative impact before and now they know to avoid it. So we've known that since about 2003, but this new study is looking at chronic pain in fruit flies and looking at significant evidence that shows not only that they have chronic pain, that they can experience chronic pain, but what causes it, which could be very helpful looking at chronic pain in humans. So what they did um, is they wanted to look at neuropathic pain, which occurs after damage to the nervous system. In humans, it's usually a burning or shooting pain and often is the result of things like sciatica, a pinched nerve, spinal cord injuries, shingles, diabetic neuropathy, cancer bone pain, and some sort of accident trauma to the body. So um, looking at neuropathic pain, what they did is they damaged a nerve in one leg of a fruit fly. Then they allowed the injury to fully heal. And after the injury healed, they found that the fly's other legs had become hypersensitive. After the animal is hurt once badly, then they try to protect themselves for the rest of their lives. So this is what they consider is some sort of chronic pain, this reception that, um, that there's the stimuli that they're trying to avoid. So they're receiving pain messages from their body and it goes through sensory neurons to the ventral nerve cord. That's basically a spinal cord, but in a fly because they don't have a spine because they're invertebrates. Um, in the nerve cord are inhibitory neurons that act like a gate that either block pain perception or allow it to proceed. And what they found was after an injury, the injured nerve dumps, they say, <laughs> this dumps all the cargo into the nerve cord and kills all the brakes forever. So basically the gates are just open to pain. There's nothing in their body telling them to not feel pain in that moment, which we depend on that, or we would always be in pain. <laughs> So now their pain threshold changes. They are hypervigilant. They are in pain all the time, it looks like. When humans, when this happens to us, it makes us miserable. We need the breaks back. That's what painkillers do, right? It tells our body to, uh, to ignore this pain stimuli that we're getting so that we can have what the researchers call a, quote, comfortable and non-painful existence. Amen. <laughs> so... 
the the what I think is really interesting here is that they were looking specifically at what causes this kind of floodgate to open. The two current hypotheses with chronic pain in humans is either peripheral sens sensitization or central disinhibition. And um, you can kind of guess what those mean based on the names. Um, but so it's this idea of responding to the stimuli or something in their central nervous system that is broken. So mm -hmm. from the genomic dissection of the neuropathic pain in their in the flies that they looked at looking at the flies neural network all their data pointed towards central disinhibition so in at least in the fruit flies the underlying cause of what they're calling chronic pain in these flies is this neuropathic issue hmm. knowing that their next steps are to see if they can make new stem cell therapies or drugs that can target this cause, shut down those gates, and stop pain in flies. If they can figure that out, then it could potentially be scaled up to humans. That's interesting. Yeah. That's really a neat, that's, this is a really amazing way to be looking at this and to be figuring out where the where it's coming from and then also now being able to figure out how to target it. I love this. I love that the University of Sydney took this study so many steps. They could say, okay, we found out fry, flies have chronic pain. There's a study. No, took it a step further. What kind of chronic pain is this? Okay, it's it's neuronal chronic pain. Great, that's a study. What's causing the chronic pain in the brain? They took it so many steps to figure this out. Uh, and it does really feel like a pretty big breakthrough in pain in flies and eventually humans. It's pretty exciting. Well, if this is, I mean, if, if we can assume that the pathways are the same in the fly, that the, mod, the, the fly model is accurate for how these systems work in humans, then we can assume that these same targets will work. And so this, um, you know, a lot of these systems in the nervous in the nervous system are not one directional, it's a loop, it's feedback. And very often, there is information constantly coming in from the periphery to the central nervous system, and it's constantly talking to the brain. And I'm imagining that in that talking, there's inhibition of a particular system, or in a, if a certain thing gets turned on or off, then that changes. It The inhibition goes away or, and then a new signal is allowed to be sent or um, it, it upregulates a certain other signal. So there's all these gates like you're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. It's, is the signal coming from the periphery turning off or turning on? Mm -hmm. And how did the damage affect that loop of information that the brain is responding to for that feeling of pain? Pain is such a, an odd thing in the world of biology because without it, you would die because you wouldn't know what to avoid and you'd hurt yourself. But too much of it and you can't survive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's this very delicate balance where if that system is broken, that's pretty detrimental to just life in general. It's Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a very delicate thing. And I, my my next thought about this also is that that it if it is a central nervous system dysregulation and not peripheral, that the damage what what people probably usually think is oh I I had this major injury on my arm say and that must have affected the nerves there and so those nerves are constantly sending a bad signal to the brain and that's the that's the pain or that's yes. like that nerve has gone bad somehow but what this is implying is that in the central nervous system somewhere something has gotten triggered and didn't reset mm -hmm. the damage occurred it triggered a change and even though the damage may have been repaired the central nervous system is not responding to that right and which so that is the interesting inflammatories aren't going to help with that in no, the long term because no, they are not that's that's targeting my bad shoulder that's not targeting my bad spinal cord <laughs> Yeah. So this is, yeah, all very interesting. And I hope it does lead to uh, a solution because chronic neuropathic pain is debilitating for people. And this, it would be amazing.
This yeah. Is I mean, thanks, Blair. Yeah, yeah. You could see how this could scale really quickly. You could test this on mice. Mm -hmm. There's even animals in captivity that have chronic pain that you know have chronic pain that you could test this on once you have some ideas mm -hmm. of how to treat this. And I'm sure there's lots of humans that would volunteer once it was ready for human study. So yeah, sure lots thing. of potential. Yeah. And who knows, maybe if, uh, I mean, who knows? I mean, the GABA system, we have lots of drugs that already are are targeting the GABA system. And so maybe we have a drug already that could have an off-label use or be tested yeah. in this regard. Maybe there's already something out there. Yeah. Yoga. Then of course is uh, GABA. <laughs> <laughs> it, does. Yeah. it does it does hey let's do some quick stories here at the end of the show everyone in my theme of artificial intelligence uh, i was taken by a story this week uh researchers have been once again trying to solve human games with artificial technology and a researcher Pierre Baldi from the University of California Irvine has developed a deep neural network that mm. has figured out how to solve a Rubik's cube and it can solve from any Rubik's cube configuration back to the solution in which all the sides you know, are all the same color all the same colors on each side uh, it solves the cube every trial now it's it learned by itself it was not taught by humans it figured it out, out itself and in 60 per, more than 60 percent of the trials it was able to do it with the least number of moves possible so it was doing it in the most efficient way so hey rubik's cubes ruined for humans forever no. <laughs> so I real quick, I actually uh, I don't know if I could do it now, but I used to be able to solve a Rubik's Cube and I was taught in my high school math class because it's all math. Yeah. It's an if then oh. scenario. Interesting. So this makes perfect sense that an AI would be able to learn how to do it, because if if it looks like this, I do this. And then if it looks like this, I do this. It's a very clear if A, then B. Um, yeah, makes sense to me. I took a more yep. mechanical engineering approach, which is if you twist just yep. to the right angle, you can pull out one, yeah, I figured, take yep, them all yep. out, re uh, put, re them yeah, put them in back in again, on. click uh -huh. in the last one real hard, uh -huh. and there you've solved it. Yeah. yeah, I don't think that's what the AI is doing. I think no. it's using the approach that Blair is talking about. But um, yeah, being mathematical. So in case you didn't know, this is another little bit of trivia. A Rubik's Cube has over 43 quintillion possible combinations. So that's all awesome. the various confirmations of where the colors can be. 43 quintillion possibilities. But how many but rules do you need to solve it, Only one. Only one is the solution. Mm -hmm. Blair, how many rules do you need to, how many rules are there to this there then scenario? So there it depends. The yeah. one that, that I learned is less rules, but it takes longer. The average solving time is about two minutes. Oh, wow. um, but there's... If you, what? If you what? learn more rules, then you can solve it in an average about 30 to 45 seconds. But about, yeah. but, but generally, like, how many rules did you have? Do you recall? Like, Six. ballpark. Oh, wow. See, so you can do it with very rules, few rules. Yeah. Six rules to solve 40 something. Yeah. Billion it's pretty fun. That's pretty yeah. awesome. I wonder if I could do Dylan. I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, the eventual idea is not just to use this to solve Ruby's cubes, but if there are other puzzles or, um, questions in the world that have these kinds of potential com numbers of p potential combinations and a small number of solutions, maybe this kind of artificial artificial intelligence network would be useful in those situations. Um, moving on from that, also, <laughs> I think this is, I love smart solutions to climate change issues, but I think researchers have just published the dumbest solution <laughs> to something that I have ever, ever heard about in my entire life. And yes, I'm being judgmental. Um, and I admit that fully. Researchers publishing or described in Science Advances, which this surprised me as, as well, that they were able to publish this in Science Adva Advances. But the Western Antarctic ice sheet is melting. And so these researchers came up with an idea of how they could save the ice sheet. Want to know how? Let's put lots of snow cannons 
pulling ocean water out of the ocean and just making snow and shooting snow onto the top of the Antarctic ice sheet. Never mind how they're going to do it. They just wanted to calculate, you know, what it would take to do it. They concluded that you could pump hundreds of billions of, uh, of you could, yeah, tons of ice per year, 62.5 to 875 gigatons per year between 10 and 50 years would help keep sea level rise at bay and to maintain it at only two to five centimeters as opposed to the inches and feet that we are looking at. If it's fully So melts. as ridiculous of an idea as it sounds, what you're talking about is preventing uh, an impact on perhaps 80% of the population on the planet. Do you know, do you know how much, we're talking about climate change, which is caused by our energy use. That's what I was going to say. You're going to have to burn so much fossil how, fuels. How do you know yeah. snow cannons? Exactly. <laughs> by diesel generators that we place yeah. on the things, which yes. also produce mm -hmm. a little bit of heat. Oh, I see what the problem is. Oh. That's a problem. Which then also helps to polluting. Go to bed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, I see what you're saying. <laughs> my, my son, no, anything, you're anything. You're shushing the future genius. generation who's actually going to have to deal with this and problem. He's, yeah, that's he the is. Thing. And, that's the thing. And he's passionate this is, about this. this so, is the future uh, yeah. generation that's actually going to have to deal with the consequences of, of, of and we're not going to take responsibility. It was past generations that really did this. It wasn't our generation. We're just stuck in the middle. We're, we're like, what do we do? Like, oh, what, me? Do something about it. Anyway, I say no snow cannons. This is the wrong engineering solution to yeah. this problem. Let's try something else. Nice try. Nice try. Let's move on. What did you bring about radioactive islands, Justin? Oh, uh, try to avoid them uh, at all costs. Yeah, that's sort of the thing. Okay. Oh, I got to find my story. Uh, oh, here it is. Yeah. So this is the, the Marshall Islands. Uh, the, this is a place where the United States tested some 70 odd nuclear bombs between 1946 and 1958. It's actually the, in the Bikini Atoll, beautiful little chain of islands in the Pacific, uh, or, uh, halfway between Australia and Hawaii and uh, the Pacific, uh, really beautiful pristine environment the kind of place you'd like to take a vacation except for the fact that the islands are more radioactive to this day than the chernobyl and fukushima nuclear disasters to this day so anyway researchers who went back and did soil samples and that sort of thing suggest eh, it's not time to move back <laughs> don't go there that's really bad so there, worse, there is worse there, than Fukushima and Chernobyl. Still, uh, this is uh, how long ago? I mean, how long ago did we set bombs off there? That's not recent. No, and one of them. Uh, so yeah, this is 1954. This is right. uh, a 70-ish years ago, I suppose. Yeah, um, it's a long time. Ago. It's also the site of the largest nuclear detonation, which was called mm -hmm. Castle Bravo, which uh, was a thousand times more powerful than any of the. Uh, bombs that were dropped in japan so the thing is there were people who were living on those islands at the time who now live on other islands not too far away who have always desired to go back to the islands that they were asked to temporarily leave right uh and science is saying no there needs to be a little bit more of a cleanup effort somebody some point tight um, yeah God. So, yeah, 70 nuclear bombs dropped in one little uh, paradise. Uh, still ain't good. God, nope. And if you know anything about Half-Life and that sort of thing, it's not going to be good for a really long time, people. <laughs> Don't go back there for a long time. We ruined it for you. Sorry. Uh, okay, Blair. So, yes. speaking of... Um, your last story here, um, there's this kind of run. It's called the Naruto run. And if you've been paying attention to social media lately, there's this whole um, storm area 51 movement where people yes. have a plan 
to, if there's enough of us, we could just yeah. run. They can't stop us all. They can't stop us all. People yes, who want to find out what's going they on in Area 51. This was a, a joke. This is not a serious thing. But one of the funny aspects of the plan is that the second line of the uh, the, the onrushers will run with the Naruto run. Oh, I'm seeing it. Yes. Running this. with their arms straight and behind them, yeah. which is awkward and That's not a way people awkward. run, but it is the way that Naruto runs in the anime. Okay. So will you, uh, that's, yep. tell, tell me why. Tell me, tell so, me about our arms. So, uh, wandering on the Harvard campus in 2015, graduate student Andrew Yegian saw someone running with straight arms. Um, and, and went, why? Wondered, what is your deal? Uh, no, I'm sorry. He wondered if straight arms are better for walking, which we all know we don't walk like this usually unless we're power walking. Why aren't they better for running and vice versa? So unfortunately, I don't have a lot of answers in this story. Um, <laughs> I have answers about walking. He selected small sample size alert. Eight undergraduate and graduate students. They ranged from runners who dabbled twice a week to actual marathon competitors. So they were all familiar with the mechanics of running and were comfortable running. But some took it much more seriously than others. And he had them walk and run on a treadmill. Um, they did this with reflectors on so that they could watch what was happening with their body and then they did it again a couple weeks later um, where they had breathed through a mask to measure oxygen consumption the hardest thing reported was running with straight arms it is difficult to do um, but in the oxygen consumption test they found that holding the arms bent while walking increases the walker's cost by 11 percent, which is maybe why power walking is exercise no matter what other people may tell you but when they looked at um, running, there wasn't really a difference between running with arms bent and running with arms straight. So there's something else going on there. And what he says, I think is so funny is, we didn't find any evidence that the energy cost was difference between arm postures when running. Um, but uh, he suspects that running with bent arms would be more efficient since, quote, that's what almost everyone does. <laughs> so if it's not an energy cons conservation thing, I wonder if it's just a cadence thing. Yeah. I think it's a um or I think it's a uh, it's a momentum based thing because if you're pulling your arm all the way back, you're pulling your body backwards in your momentum. If it's you keep it closer to the body, you're not putting negative motion in your movement quite as much and but that would the then motion. but that would then influence the energy efficiency though i mean it it should yeah, yeah it would increase yeah i don't know energy but maybe spend, also they need to test people that aren't good at running maybe that's yeah, part of it a... they need to activate fight or flight in somebody <laughs> and have them run with their arms oh, straight I'm and so see what happens of the experiment. <laughs> well which we might see at this area 51 by the way if you go to area 51 the first sign no photography or, or devi recording devices allowed beyond this point there's a second sign which says deadly force is authorized but beyond this point which means they don't have to arrest everyone no they and they said that they won't they said they that they will just shoot you they will enforce this yeah. space. They will enforce yeah. their space. Yeah. So, hey, people, don't put your lives in danger, please. By the I way, mean, the real go, area go ahead and Naruto run, just yeah. not at Area 51. Yeah. The, the real yeah. secret of Area 51 is it's a highly toxic, highly toxic environment uh, in which they uh, used very toxic elements to make uh, radar and visible planes. And that was the big secret that they were keeping. And that's why uh, people uh, get diseases yeah. there and can't yeah. report them to their doctor because they can't find out what gave it to them. Yeah. yeah. Um, last really funny, funny story that's kind of cute. Researchers just published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society about their study looking at chimpanzees and bonobos, uh, watching movies, um, because people like to bond over Netflix or a movie that you you spend some time watching something together. There's social bonding. It brings you closer together because you've done this thing together. And nobody had ever really looked at that with great apes 
our relatives. And so these researchers were like, hey, what happens when chimpanzees and bonobos Netflix and chill? Turns out it seems to increase their social bonding as well. However, the catch here is that they only watched the apes for about three minutes after the movie was over. What? <laughs> So for the three minutes after the movie was over, what they were great friends, but they did, they didn't look did, any. Did they have a dinner reservation? What? <laughs> what kind of research is that? Stick around. Uh, oh, I will they're say they're still in proximity for three minutes. Oh that, my god! What? Oh, like, so yeah. I, I will say watching TV changes your brain wave, right? It, yes. So I. Yeah. It makes sense for that and reason, is, if nothing and, else. Right. And this is something that uh, primatologist Franz de Waal in this Guardian article brings up is the effect of synchronization on behavior. And that is if you're looking at something, the same thing that somebody else is doing, you have synchronized brain patterns for mm -hmm. that period of watching. And this is what may lie behind this idea of empathy, of social bonding, shared experience. Um, but this is something that they're still looking at. And I can't believe they only tracked them for three minutes after the <laughs> movie was over. But anyway, um, in the study, though, they did determine that these great apes also Netflix and chill. Mm. I just want to know what they were watching. Like, what, uh, what, the what the, the apes at the zoo really like uh, cartoons. They really like Disney films. That's really? Yeah. Wow. See, you could even do this study <laughs> for longer than three longer. minutes. Yeah. <laughs> I could. Okay, everyone. We hope that you enjoyed this. Maybe you watched this on YouTube with somebody else and synchronized your brains. Maybe you're listening to this podcast with somebody else, synchronizing your auditory neural signals with the brain of the person next to you. Maybe you're on your own in your own little brainwave. Thank you for joining us. We made it to the end of another show. What, what? I want to say thank you to Fada for helping with show notes and sh uh, show descriptions and social media. Thank you to Identity4 for helping to record the podcast. Thank you to Gord for managing our chat room. Thank you to our Patreon sponsors. Thank you, Paul Disney, Richard Onimus, Ed Dyer, Ed, Andy Gross, Du Pollock, Philip Shane, Ken Hayes, Harrison, Harrison Prather, Charlene Henry, Joshua Fury, Steve DeBell, Alex Wilson, Tony Steele, Craig Landon, Mark Mazaros, Jack Matthew Litwin, Jason Roberts, Bill K. Bob Calder, Time Jumper 319, Eric Knapp, Richard Brian Condren, Dave Neighbor, Gene Tellier, John Gridley, David Williams, Corinne Benton, Adam LaJoy, Sarah Chavis, Rodney, Tiffany Boyd, John Bertram, Mountain Sloth, Seth O'Gradney, Stephen Albron. John Ratnaswamy, Dave Friedel, Daryl Myshak, Andrew Swanson, Paul Ronovich, Sue Doster, Dave Wilkinson, Ben Vignell, Richard Porter, Noodles, Kevin Reardon, Christoph Zuknarek, Ashish Pants, Ulysses Adkins, RTM, Rick Ramis, Paul, John McKee, Jason Olds, Brian Carrington, Christopher Dreyer, Lisa Slazuski, Drim Poe, Greg Riley, Sean Lamb, Ben Rothig, Steve Leesman, Kurt Larson, Rudy Garcia, Marjorie, Gary S., Robert Greg Briggs, Brendan Minish, Christopher Rappin, Flying Out, Aaron Luthen, Matt Sutter, Mark Hessenflo, Kevin Parachan, Byron Lee, and EO. Thank you. For your support on Patreon. If any of you are interested in supporting us, you can find information at twist.org. There's a link to Patreon there. You can go directly to patreon.com slash this week in science. You can also subscribe and tell your friends to subscribe. We have the links at twist.org on next week's show. So far, it's just the science trio. Blair, Justin, and myself. No interview as of yet. That might be kind of fun, but we do love these interviews. Many thanks to Lucas Pesteka for his conversation on variable constants today. And again, next week, we will be broadcasting online live at 8 p.m. Pacific time on twist.org slash live. You can watch and join our chat room, but don't worry if you can't make it. You can find all of our past episodes at our YouTube channel or twist.org. Thank you for enjoying the show. Uh, Twist is also available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science in your iTunes directory, or you can look for This Week in Science in anything Apple Marketplace. -y. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes will be available on our website. That's at www.twist.org. Uh, that includes information on our guest if you're interested. And while you're there, you can also make comments and start conversations with the hosts and other listeners. 
or you can just contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or Blair at blairbaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in the subject line. Otherwise, what will happen, Blair? Oh, uh, I believe your email will be spam filtered into oblivion. Into oblivion. You can also hit us up on the Twitter where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that came to you tonight, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show... Remember, it's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robot with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Science is coming your way, so everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth, and I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just not understand. But we're not trying to threaten your philosophy, we're just trying to save the world from jeopardy. And this week in science is coming your way. So everybody listen to everything we say. And if you use our methods instead of rolling a die, we may rid the world of toxoplasma. Got the eye. Because it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science, science, science. I've got a laundry list of items I want to address. From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness. I'm trying to promote more rational thought. And I'll try to answer any question you've got. So how can I ever see the changes I seek when I can only set up shop one hour a week? This week in science is coming your way. You better just listen to what we say. And if you learn anything from the words that we said, then please just remember. It's all in your head Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science 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 This week in science This week in science This week in science 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 This week in science This week in science this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, this week in science. And we have come to the end of another show. Where, yes, I'm watching Blair solve the Rubik's Cube. She's working on it. I was hoping you would she would be done before the end of the song. I can't remember, guys. It's been a long time. <laughs> but you got it to you got it into that the cross formation, yeah. right? Isn't that like one of the big steps? Is, yes, like one of the... that part I remember. I'm having trouble remembering the other parts. Yeah, there's like there are like three phases. It's like getting them into these the straight line. There's like one set of straight lines, and then the cross, 
and then you go on to do a couple of other things. Okay, I never so actually fun. learned how to do it. I, that would be fun. Kai, you have to learn how to solve a Rubik's Cube. I have no idea. I can't solve one in five days. Oh, you could if you knew how. There's only five pieces. No, you can't. It's five pieces. Right up. You did. You spilled the water. Don't spill it. You should be sleeping. Hmm. Really Kai's blaming a fly it's on the fact me crazy. on the fact that he's not sleeping. It's also uh -oh. the light and making this really loud noise. I think that's excuses. If excuses were booses, no, that's not it. <laughs> no. What is the phrase? I think that's if it is wishes a, were is, bitches. There is a very loud fly though that's been quite annoying in here. Okay, can you? Okay, so don't go after the fly because those are my lights. Oh, so yeah. stay stay away and you need to listen to me. Take that chip clip, please, and wrap up the bag because that's not going to stay down here when we go upstairs. Yeah, you are in kooky brain mode because you're up too late. Mm -hmm. Trouble remembering. Oh, Ed. I know, Hot Rod. That's the, the way to do it. Break okay, it apart. Okay, I got my crosses back. You got your crosses. There you go. There's two more steps, and I'm trying to remember mm -hmm. how it goes. Yeah, but it was on my lights, which I don't want Kai touching. I don't... The, <laughs> look, the cats can eat the flies. I'm not going to promote fly eating by my son. I'm not going to eat it. Ooh. I'm not going to eat it. Muscle memory is a cool thing. Go muscle memory. Muscle memory? What is muscle memory? Are you getting there? Uh-huh. Getting there. Getting there. Going getting for there. it. Hold it up high. Well, okay. What? Did you finish for, it? No. For Wait. all I know, oh, she for got all I know, high. you had two Rubik's Cubes down there. One that was solved. You gotta you yeah. gotta hold it up higher so that we can actually see you working on it. There you go. Oh, oh, she's moving. She's grooving. Ah, she's in the zone. She. Whoa. Well, yeah. Yeah. No, maybe. So she is oh, in the zone. She's, she's really almost close. there. Wow. Look at this. Oh my gosh. It's no. Okay. <laughs> okay. It is pretty loud. Maybe, maybe. Okay. Go the other way. It's loud. Yeah. Go the other really way. Loud. Uh, maybe it's seven rules. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's <laughs> number of yeah. types of moves. It's not six yeah. moves. It's six like things well, you yeah, have to memorize I mean, how maybe to it's do. Seven types of moves. Then. If you see no, a no, no. nomination, then you done. do. Yeah. She is almost done. I really want to see the combination. Hold it up. I don't believe you if I can't see it. Oh, don't mess up her flow. She's got flow. Hold it up higher. All right. So now chair. I'm almost done. So now I just have to, I have to rotate these now. Yeah. yeah. That's why I get the clawed hammer out and pry one of them. So uh, I think uh, in, in the last couple of weeks, we in, in the last, in the last couple of weeks, there was the world Rubik's cube championships and I believe they were in Australia, New Zealand or Australia. And a friend of mine who lives in New Zealand had a friend coming through because they were on their way with their son to oh, these championships. Time. And he was competing. And he took a video of this child solving the Rubik's Cube. He solved the Rubik's Cube with two hands in something like uh like 17 seconds 13 seconds oh. it was the fastest blah, 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 it, everything spun shoo, 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 shoo. What, what i find really fascinating and he could solve that, it with one hand he was like this and he solved it with one hand what i find really fascinating about that story is that uh, america had a brief seconds. fascination with australia in the 80s <laughs> and so everything 80s they're still clinging on to and uh, i love it the rubik's cube where Blair, I, we can't see it. It's not happening. It's fine. It's happening. I believe I can see it. Why can't you see it? I can see her doing it through the I microphone. Can, I can see her looking with <laughs> the Blair concentration face. <laughs> not looking in the right place. I, I, it's there. We go. Now we can see it. Just look in the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> Look, it's almost done. <laughs> no, no, it's not. It's... Look, there's all purple. Almost. Yeah. What? There's a purple. Side. I love. I love how your Rubik's cube is worn. It's battle scarred. You're sinking. Yeah, it's from tearing it apart with a clawed hammer. I really. I know the secret. It's you're sinking. It's off camera. There we go. Up, oh, up, hot, up, up. hot rod, hot rods giving competition tips: melted Vaseline and salt to get the quick spin on it, right? Because uh -huh. it's, it's not. It's like uh, the fake Abraham Lincoln quote. It's uh, it's not how hard you swing the axe; it's how long you spend. It's, what is it? I don't know what the quote is. Spend more time sharpening an axe than you do cutting the tree. Do they still I'm make the pyramid them. Rubik's? Yes, they do. They make all sorts of shapes Rubik's, actually. There's also these strange, like, ones Can't I can tell. They're like these mm -hmm. weird, They're like, oval shapes mm -hmm. with then pyramids on the, on, the, on, the, on the top and bottom. And they're very small. Okay. Great. Now we're cooking with gas. Blair. Can't see it. It's not happening. Gas. There we go. Oh, yeah. There is improvement. What on you one do side. is you get it to a certain point and then you start solving side by side. Uh, I did not mm -hmm. learn the side by side method. Oh, no. No. So, like mm -hmm. right now, the last thing I have to do now is I have to rotate these corners. Right. So, one of my corners was out of sync, which is why it wasn't working. Mm -hmm. But now it's in sync. Yeah. Like, I'm getting there. I'm rotating the corners. This is going to take a while. It's true, yeah. Thunder Beaver. But every time she gets one corner, another corner gets put oh, off. Oh, man. Did that sticker come off? Yeah, the sticker's not matter. coming off. Uh -huh. It doesn't matter. You don't know what colors bad. are there anyway. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, wow. That is so this is, yeah, there's another layer to this. Big <laughs> even Watching a colorblind <laughs> girl try to solve her Rubik's Cube. <laughs> there, I got it. No, oh, just humor her. Yeah, well Best done. Part. This Keep is the mind. thing. People have been telling you you're good at Rubik's Cube out of sympathy. No. It's so How rude. <laughs> oh, now you did it. Fantastic. Job. Yay. You uh, got it. Oh, I have one more to go. It's more than one, but okay. There we go. Ta -da! Yay! I still know how. That's awesome. Calm down. That's awesome, Blair. I'm impressed. Skills. That is. It only took me what ten minutes. <laughs> no, no, I think that was under two. Twenty. It just 20. Like it 20. It was no, not 20. 20 you don't have to shout. It was not 20. Oh, Here, no. I can find when somebody in the chat room said timer, and that's right when I started. Okay. Oh. Let me see. How many was heads up? Uh, oh, 11. So it took me 11 minutes. Not bad. 11 minutes. There we go. I know she needs a new yeah. Rubik's cube. I do need a new Rubik's cube. Although um, the world record holder at the time came to my math class and <clears throat> lubed my cube. So this one is very special. Yeah. Uh, fun, fun trivia fact. I yeah. once uh, worked with the gentleman who had the world record for achieving the longest play at Pac-Man. Mm -hmm. Wong. And he did it at Fluffy's Donuts here in Davis, California. Um, Dave, in the chat room, he lubed my cube. What that means is he popped the corner cube off How and sprayed it. some WD-40 inside, oh. which is why it's so loosey-goosey. Oh. Yeah. Mm. Hot Rod was recommending uh, Vaseline and salt mm. uh, yeah. Yeah, to WD-40 braid it and then you wash it all out and it's supposedly slicker mm. and smoother yeah i do need a new rubik's cube these are all coming off how sad i want to i actually also all the stickers are falling off what? I, actually took, I once there was this rubik's cube in my class and someone couldn't solve it so they took they started taking apart the rubik's cube yeah but the rubik's cube the cubes weren't even actual cubes there were no. just these tiny little things yeah. mm -hmm. going onto a ball that really didn't roll yeah. well. It wasn't really a good Rubik's cube, and like it, he actually broke it when taking it off. It's like so, I was trying to stick it back on. You're not and supposed to break it when you do that. 
So there is a method, and what it is is you take the one mm -hmm. of the one of the tops and you twist it at the opposing angle, and then you pry off uh, the one that's that's overhanging the most. You pry that one off, and then the rest just slide out, and then you can rebuild it. Uh, it's not the same way that uh, Blair did it, but I could do it mm -hmm. faster mm -hmm. in eleven minutes. You can also just take all the stickers off. Well, you have to have a fresh one. You have to have a real fresh one to do yeah. the sticker method. There's a so I, I fixed this one with um, nail polish. I have to nail polish some of these. See, there's a purple one that's coming. It's Look not at purple, my green okay. side. There's a lot of different greens there. <laughs> yeah. So I've had to like color them in. This is purple. Some of it. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. supposed to be purple. One of them's brown, but okay. No. Yeah. This one? This is yeah, purple. it's brown. It's purple. It's um, it's brown. <laughs> but the white one you can, I don't know if you can see, is like oh, they're peeling brown. off all the white ones. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Anyway, the yellow side's Yay, fine. Rubik's cube. Yeah, the yellow side's fine. New cubes don't use stickers. Oh, really? Interesting. They're not? That's old tech. Well, this is pretty old tech. This is from 2002. I have one from 2000. What? 18? Oh, 18. Yeah, we. I think we it's got actually, it for you like a um, year or two plastic. ago. It's not. It's no more stickers. It's actually now colored plastic. Mm. Um. What there was a called? there was a Rubik's cube that somebody got that had pictures on them, and so it was like pieces of a picture. The mm. problem mm. is. If you get it back looking like this, it's actually not. This isn't always in the exact same place. Yeah. What? So yeah, if you be. do, if it's like a jigsaw puzzle on one side uh -huh. and you mix it up and you put it back together, it will not necessarily make your picture again. Wait a yeah. second. So you mean the sides can uh, can kind of swap like the purple is not the No, that can't be right. No, no, no. It's like the white square that's in the upper left corner is yeah. not the next time you solve it necessarily going to be in the upper left corner it might be down in the bottom right or in over on another side what? right so if no. you have a picture that's there when you solve it it's not always going to look like that because why do i want my, my, i just intuitively think that can't be true i didn't i didn't think that was true either until i did it huh. and the uh, picture ended up all funky yeah is you know what it was i think maybe it was the center one because these are always the same because like purple and green are always but it's the was... center one pivots okay and so the picture was all weird looking depending on how you got to the, the yeah. solution okay yeah. so that, that that part makes sense the outer ones the the corner yeah. ones that didn't make any sense to me right yes now you're what right, you're, you're saying right. makes a lot of sense yeah 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 so Kai is up way past his bedtime. What time is it? Almost 10 30. I'm happy to call it. I'm I'm super and tired. I have a bit of a cold. 10 um, when, when does Google Hangouts streaming to live go away? Um beginning of August. <gasps> Yikes. Okay, so next week so in, in our after two. show, we have to make some decisions. Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. Sounds uh, like figure out how to uh, do that. On that but. note, say goodnight, Kai. Good night. Also, I have a question. Oh, oh yeah. never mind. Yeah, I want to. Can we make a twist, kids? There should be. There That's should up to be. your mom. Yeah, like, She's the executive like, I producer. I guess my friends are into science, and then yep. like, I was like, you guys could like help us if like um we got something wrong. Yeah, and it, I have a couple of collaborators who would love to, to join you in that. So oh, I bet. Yeah. yeah. Some uh, like who who like to do YouTube yeah. stuff as well. It basically be um uh, basically um earlier um like daytime like after school. Yeah, not at night. Twist, I right. think it would be fun if you started it at midnight. <laughs> midnight, <laughs> right after our show. Yeah, you should come on <laughs> after our show. We'll be like the lead in that gets the audience here, and then you guys pick up our audience and carry them to the midnight hour. I think. That would be <laughs> yeah, yeah. The well, well, we go to yeah, sleep. Yeah. <laughs> Say goodnight, Blair. Good night, Blair. Say goodnight, Justin. Good night, Justin. <gasps> Good night. Good night, Kiki. Kiki. Good night, everyone. I hope you all enjoyed the show tonight. And I hope that we'll see you again next week. And um, yeah, that's all I got for right now because I'm tired. Kai, don't hit the button. So. I won't. I won't. I don't. <laughs>
You yeah, gotta hit I it. Hit, I hit the button. It's my job. Why is that your job? Because it's my job. When we make twist kids, I get to press the red button. <laughs> I press the red button. <laughs> All right. And the green button. And on that note, good night.